Amen. Thank you, Kev. Welcome to BBC. Welcome to week four of Naked, our four-week series on sex, sexuality, marriage, singleness, hookups, pornography, masturbation, whatever you can kind of think of to go along with your sex drive. We've been trying to cover over the last four weeks. It's been a lot of fun. Tonight's message will probably make most sense in the context of the three message that is, uh, messages that have come before. And so I would encourage you to get on the website and to download those, especially if you're visiting us here tonight for the first time. Some people have asked what is coming up next at Bryanston. Um, what uh, preaching series are we dealing with next? I thought I'd just give you a little heads up. Tomorrow afternoon, I get on a plane for the west coast of the United States where I'm going to go traveling with my family for six weeks to just kind of recover from the last four weeks. Um, and I'm going to be writing and dreaming and kind of vision casting for the church going forward and planning some future sermon series. While I'm away, we've got some really, really excellent stuff going on. Next week, we've got a family service celebrating dads. And so in the morning services, the 8.30 and the 10.30, we're going to let the kids in here to give the parents a greater appreciation for what what it's like um, in the rooms next door, okay, because it's going to be like chaos, um, uh, it's going to be like some terrible scary movies, um, and parents are going to decide to keep their families at just the size that they are right now, um, and not to extend any further, but we're going to be honoring all the generations in the two morning services, and in the evening, Kev Aldridge is going to be preaching, um, especially on the father heart of God, and how God is a great dad, and I think it's going to be a powerful time. We then move into a five-week series called Advance, we've invited friends from around our network, friends in other churches from around the city, around the country, and around the globe to come share with us how the church is actually advancing in different contexts around the world. And so if you're kind of hesitant about church and you want to hear some of the good stuff that's going on around the world, that series is going to be really helpful for you. If you've connected with BBC, but you find me offensive, you get a six week break um, and you get some different voices. And so that should be a great celebration for you as well. But I would encourage you and really ask you to come along to those and to engage in those in community. I think it's going to be a really transformative time for us. Here's where we've been. First week we said, what is the big deal? about sex. Everyone talks about it. Everyone wants to have it. Everyone pretends they're having a lot more of it than they really are, and we're continually bombarded by it in the media. What is the big deal? Does the Bible have anything to say about it? We discovered that the Bible actually has quite a lot to say about sex, and that perhaps it's not as boring as you think. In fact, the, in fact, the Bible paints a wonderful spiritual view of sex in which it calls us to a higher standard of sexiness, not a lower standard of sexiness that culture calls us to, but it says that it's because it's so important, it has some parameters and it has a protective framework and that's not just safe sex, um, that's covenant relationship that God asks us to honor because this is a big deal. He's not asking us to be less sexy, he's asking us to be more sexy. Week two, we said, well, then what is the big deal about marriage? In this day and age, um, can we really think that we can be married to one person forever till death do us part? Really? What if they live a long time? Um, and, and what if they get fat? And what if they get poor? And what if they get annoying? Um, those three things will happen probably about day three of the relationship. And so then what do you do? Is this like a full maintenance lease? Can you send it back? Or is it Nikki take back? I mean, well, what is marriage? And, and how does this work? And can you really expect one person to satisfy you forever? And the Bible said marriage is a covenant relationship. It's not just about commitment. It's not just about feel good. Again, it's a spiritual thing. That is this wonderful thing ordained by God. And he takes us at our word when we give vows before him. There's hope for those who have had marriages who failed. And God is a loving and gracious and merciful God. But he calls us to really, really nurture those relationships and to look after them well. Week three, we said, what's the big deal about gender? Are men and women really different? Aren't these just social constructs? Are men really from Mars and women really from Venus? Um, can we really communicate across the gender lines? Are there different roles for us, perhaps, in the home and in the church and in society? And we got away with that remarkably unscathed. Um, I've been stitched up, and I think we are, we're, we're going to be okay. And then this week, we're going to look at, well, what's the big deal about cheap sex? I mean, there, there's a lot of continual kind of stimulus in the world the whole time saying, hey, you don't necessarily have to have sex with someone in order for you to relieve the urge. What's the big deal about that? Can't it be no harm, no foul? No one gets hurt, right? This last week, I had the tremendous privilege and the incredibly intimidating gig uh, of speaking to about 250 high school teenage boys about the topic of sex. They, they told me, you've got 90 minutes to talk to these guys about sex. Now, talking to a couple of hundred teenage boys about sex is like talking to a couple of hundred starving people about steak. Um, and so uh, <laughs> they, they were very, very attentive and yet uh, continually distracted um, by their desires um, and the, the many different things that they would think about um, within a 90-minute time frame. The stats 
tell us that in the 90 minutes, each boy would have thought about sex 2,467 times. Um, and in this session, it was probably even worse. And so I did Q&A with them. Um, we took some, um, some question and answer time. It was a wonderful time. But what I realized from these boys is even at an early age, they could kind of get and understand that actual intercourse with a living person was kind of a big deal. They knew that. They wanted to do it, and they wanted to do it a lot. Um, and they wanted to do it in a whole bunch of different creative ways. We had the whiteboard out at one point. Um, but uh, they, they knew that that was a big deal. They knew that it was a big deal. They were kind of intimidated by it. They knew that perhaps it might have been a spiritual act and something that they should take seriously. But they wondered about, what about cheap opportunities for easy sexual engagement? Uh, What about porn? Uh, What about strip clubs? I mean, these women seem liberated. Isn't this willing buyer, willing seller kind of situation? What about a fantasy life where I I just live in a realm where maybe I've read some books about someone tying me up and now I just think about that all of the time, ladies, and and that's kind of uh, my kind of, oh, I'm so liberated, please tie me up, Um, which is weird. Um, It's kind of a contradiction in terms. But uh, what if I live just kind of a fantasy life and, and I just think about different partners and the different elements that they might bring? These were teenage boys, so it was like, what about the underwear section of the Woolworths catalog? What about the underwear section of the Woolworths shop, you know, like when I'm walking behind my mom and I get sidetracked into the lingerie section and bad stuff happens. What about, uh, what about that? What about images that I just see in the media? And many of us wrestle with the same questions as we are continually, male and female, bombarded by sexual stimulus, and we try to figure out how, how do we live a life uh, that, where we make rise, wise and right decisions in a very sexualized world. Many of us in this room are, are trying to figure out how do we apply our faith in a very sexualized world. Now, I, don't know, I know that's not true for all of you. Some of you are saying, I don't have faith. I'm really glad that you're here. But for many people, they're saying, well, I actually believe that Jesus rose from the dead and that my life's supposed to be about honoring him. How do I do that in a world where I'm continually bombarded with sexual stimulation? Famous sexologist was speaking on the radio on Friday. I've been listening to her show in preparation for this series and doing everything that I can not to phone in every week because the Christian guy never comes across well, right? She like started, I'm a pastor, and they're just like, we hate you! You hate women, and you say I can't have fun, and I hate you! And then they cry, and then you get into the real issues. But that's kind of the way that it, that it, that it always goes. But she was saying this. Her conclusion was it is time for us to get rid of our old conservative views. I wrote this down in the car, pulled over. It's time for us to get rid of our old conservative views in which we claim that one person can satisfy us in every way, and we need to rather redefine the rules of relationship to a place where we are all open to getting sexual fulfillment wherever and however we are most satisfied at the time. That's the voice of the age. What does the older voice say? Does the scripture speak about this? This is Bryanston Bible Church after all. And I don't expect you to believe the Bible, but you should expect us to believe the Bible. Uh, The world actually needs a church that actually does believe the Bible. And so if we went to the scripture, what would it say to us? Well, let's start with the apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament. He says this in 1 Corinthians, a, a sexually wild church. Insane. They make you guys look like a bunch of saints. And, and I know most of what you get up to because you put it on Facebook. <laughs> Flee. And the word that he used there is run for your life like a lion's trying to kill you. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Hey, here's what Paul's saying. You're not just an animal. You're not just an animal. This body contains not only flesh, but it contains a soul as well. And and when we sin against this body, we sin against our own souls, and we sin against the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul's saying, you're not just an animal. Sexual sin actually matters. Now, he uses the term sexual immorality. He uses the Greek word porneia. And it's kind of a catch-all word for, for all of these kind of cheap sexual engagements. When he's talking about uh, married people having sex outside of marriage, he calls it adultery. When he's talking about people having sex before marriage, he calls it fornication. Then he's got this other word, porneia, which is a catch-all word for all of the other ways that people were sinning sexually. Uh, This includes the temple prostitution that they were engaging in frequently. Uh, This includes kind of the strip clubs and erotic orgy parties of the day. Uh, We think we're the most forward-thinking society. Other people thought this up thousands of years ago. This includes the erotic material, written material, that was famous in that world. Uh, We think Fifty Shades is revolutionary. That stuff was written ages ago, ages ago. And Paul includes all of that kind of stuff in this catch-all term, 
porneia. And what does he say? Run away from it as fast as you can if you have faith. He goes on, 1 Thessalonians, writing to another church. He says, for this is the will of God. This is what God wants for people who have crossed the line of faith. Your sanctification. He doesn't want you just to get saved and then to continue living the same way. He actually wants Christians to change, and so does the world. If you haven't crossed the line of faith, one of your major accusations is that Christians keep doing the things that they always did, they never change. Well, that's not the will of God. The will of God is that people would change, sanctification. One of the ways that that happens is you abstain from porneia, sexual immorality, and that each one of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust, not just giving into it, not just scratching every itch, not just going with every urge that feels good, but actually disciplining yourself, not like the Gentiles who do not know God. They don't have a framework to go like, to say that there's a higher power and that there's a spirit dwelling within them, and so they can give into every urge, but Christians really shouldn't. Christians really shouldn't. And it's about time the church stopped judging the world and expecting the world to act like Christians when Christians themselves aren't living out their own sanctification by fleeing from sexual immorality. I'm going to be away for six weeks. I'm going to preach with all i got tonight. And so we're going to be in your face tonight, and it's going to be long, and we're not going to let you out. <laughs> so some people might go, okay, but I've heard of this Paul chap. I've heard of this guy. He sounds like no fun at all. What about Jesus? We like Jesus. Everyone likes Jesus. People just hate the church, but everyone likes Jesus. He looks super hip. He's got immaculate hair. He's got amazing sandals. And he says incredible stuff that you can put inside fortune cookies. I mean, every time he opens his mouth, you're like, write that down. We can put that inside Chinese desserts for the rest of time. And, and so he says amazing stuff like turn the other cheek and go the extra mile and uh, forgive your enemies. Uh, what is, surely he's more chilled on this whole Pornea deal than Paul. Surely he would say, oh, guys, don't worry about it. Don't worry, just ask, have fun. Just knock yourselves out. Put that on a fortune cookie. Jesus says this, I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent, what he says there is, anyone who objectifies someone as a sexual object for their own fancy, this applies the other way as well, ladies, when we objectify someone for our own fancy and for our own desires, they've already committed adultery with them in their heart. So he's talking to a bunch of religious leaders. They're saying, hey, I stay faithful to my wife, but I've got some other stuff on the side. That stuff's all fine, right? And Jesus goes, no, 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 no. I set the bar much higher than Paul. I said to you, that's adultery. That's like sleeping around. Now, the good news is that he offers grace to adulterers. He does it all the time. But he wants them to understand the way in which their heart is actually offending him and hurting themselves. So why would Jesus say something like this? I mean, we know he's a wild man who says unpredictable things. It's one of the reasons I just love him and worship him, because you can't contain him. You go read the Gospels, he's just unpredictable. It's just like, you can't say that, especially not in church, but he says it all the time. But why would he say this? Is he trying to kill our joy? Is he trying to make us miserable? Is he trying to ruin all of our fun? Well, the overarching theme of Scripture is that God loves us, and that Jesus is sent into the world to give us life, not death, and to give us life to the full. He tells us. He says, the life that you're living is not full enough. I want to give you something better. And one of the things he warns us against is sexual morality. Maybe the God of the Bible actually loves us more than we love ourselves. And maybe he can see something behind the stuff that we cannot. You see, we think, just stick with me, I want you to help interpret the message of your age we think, when it comes to this kind of stuff, that freedom comes from lack of instruction. That's what the sexologist was saying on Friday. She's saying, oh, just do away with all the rules. That's where real freedom comes. But we don't apply that in everyday life. When I'm sitting stationary in traffic, okay, obeying the rules of the road, not checking Facebook, not tweeting about traffic, and, and I'm sitting there waiting, and a taxi comes down on the pavement at 120 k's an hour and knocks down like 400 people in the process, I don't look across and go like, oh, it's such freedom. <laughs> I love how they just live without constraint. Bless those guys. They're the best. That's, that's real life right there. We go like, no, give me a baseball bat, and so I can go and initiate some constraint into the life of someone else. We don't raise our families like this, and if you're going to have a family in the future, hopefully you don't raise your family like this. I don't say to Daniel, I shouldn't because I'd be a bad dad. He's two years old. I don't say to him, bad, hey, bro, just do whatever you like. Whatever comes into your heart, do that. 
You know what would happen? He would burn my house down. <laughs> That's what's in his heart. This looks flammable. This thing could burn to the ground while we danced in the garden in a circle. That's what's in his heart. And so when we tell people, do what's in your heart, that's the dumbest advice in the whole world. It's daft. We don't believe in it. We don't run families like that. We don't run society like that. And so as a loving dad, I go to Daniel. I go, bud, man, I love you. I adore you. I'm furiously pursuing your joy. And because of that, I want to tell you, hey, don't do that. Don't do that. Here's a few things you shouldn't do because I don't want you to go to jail, <laughs> especially not at two years old. Okay, it's going to go badly for you. And so because I love him, I place some constraints on him for his joy and for his good. You've never seen someone go skydiving and just say like, you know what would be a lot more fun if I didn't have the constraint of this parachute? <laughs> no, the parachute is what gives you freedom. Rather we say, hey, thank goodness for this constraint because then it doesn't become boy meets world and boy spreads over a large area. You know, like the, that enables me to have fun and to have joy. I think God is doing the same thing when he warns us about sexual sin. I think he is. So what can he see that we can't see? Perhaps he can see that the whole thing is built on a lie, that the whole thing's a mirage, that the whole thing's a facade, and that if we believe it, we actually end up prisoners of the very thing that we think is setting us free. So just a, a few pieces of information for you tonight, then I'm going to get into interviewing a couple of guests. How can we understand the real cost of cheap sex? The first thing I want you to know is that cheap sex is a liar. It's a liar. Now remember, I'm saying this includes everything, all the kind of secret fantasy life, strip clubs, prostitution, porn, all of that stuff in there together. It lies. It, first of all, it lies about beauty. I'll just say this to you. I'm worried about future marriages in this room because many of us are currently building up a standard of beauty that our future spouse will never, ever, ever be able to compete with. And so you're setting yourself up and you're setting your spouse up for failure. And those images that you have of beauty, they don't really exist. In research for this series, I watched a lot of interviews with guys at porn conventions trying to understand how the business works. And one of the guys was saying, you know, one of the worst things that's happened to porn in terms of sales is HD, is high definition. Because it becomes increasingly difficult for them to hide blemishes. And so they're looking into other low-res solutions, 3D imaging that's low-res, so that they can bring back the myth of the perfect body. Because in HD, you can see everything, and they can't hide all of that with lighting. This week, Victoria's Secret announced a, a plus-size catalog and a new model for their plus-size catalog. I thought, with permission, I, I told one of my elders, hey, I'm going to check this thing out. Do you want to come join me? Um, uh, because for research, um, and uh, uh, let's, let's, let's have a look at what this looks like. And, and, we, and, and I took a look at the image that they put on Twitter, and like, yeah, she, she was a bigger lady than the normal model. Uh, she, was actually, she was actually a really pretty lady. But I want to tell you, she did not have one dent, one piece of cellulite, one bulging line anywhere, and I was just like, oh, so even when they try to tell us that they don't have that standard of beauty, they like us all the same. And so they use a bigger lady and they Photoshop her to death. It's a lie. It's a lie. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter five, it says, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, especially to men. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. She's a lovely deer, a graceful doe. That's just golden stuff for some romance at home. You can try that one later. You can just go home and look across the table at your lady and just say, you know, when I look at you, I, I, I just, you're just like a, like a kudu. And you're just <laughs> so graceful. You're, you're like a, you've got the teeth of a red heart beast. <laughs> and, and, and your skin is like a hemspock. You know? Try it. It's going to go well. <laughs> it says, let her breasts, it's in the Bible, satisfy you at all times with delight and be intoxicated always in her love. What's it saying? Your standard of beauty is your spouse. If you don't have a spouse, your standard of beauty is your future spouse. My standard of beauty is about this tall. She's blonde. Her name's Sue, and she lives at my house. 
Our standard of beauty is about 34 years old and blonde and petite and with a little boy called Daniel. And in 20 years' time, my standard of beauty will be 54 years old and blonde and petite and living in my house. It also lies about sex. Porn does this especially well. Strip club does this as, uh, as well. Uh, no one ever has a headache. <laughs> uh, never seen it. Recover. Cut the movie quite short. Uh, not today. Sorry, thanks. Uh, it's never that time of the month. People never just don't feel like it. And that's going to happen to you in marriage. You're going to go like, hey, hey, what do you think? No, not a chance. Go. <laughs> Are you insane? No one ever gets depressed. Men never suffer from erectile dysfunction. Everyone in every image has a massive sex drive and a massive sexual connection from the get-go. Pizza guy rings the doorbell and they have incredible sex for 45 minutes. Never seen each other before, never seen each other again. And if you consume that, you go like, that's what sex is like. No, it's not. No, it's not. And again, you set your spouse and your future spouse up for failure. That's why we see so many men. Gorgeous wife in the bed, sleeping next door. While he looks at images on the screen, he set himself up for failure. Cheap sex not only lies, it also spreads. It's not something that you can contain in secret. I'll tell you this, that, that it forms habitual pathways. Whatever you're doing, whether it's fantasy life, whether it's attending strip clubs, whether it's um, addiction to porn, it is addictive and it is progressive. It's considered triple A rated for addiction, which puts it um, right up there with methamphetamines and cocaine. The same sexologist who was telling us um, on Friday that we should just all live out our fancy said, yeah, pornography is actually very, very dangerous. She said, because it's accessible, it's affordable, and it's anonymous. Triple A rating for addictive behavior. John Mayer, the famous musician who I used to respect a lot, who I'm struggling to respect anymore, in a recent interview with Playboy magazine, said that he no longer will even bother to get out of bed before he has viewed thousands of pornographic images. He has woken up next to supermodel after supermodel after supermodel, and he now says that he actually finds pornography way better than real women because it's more predictable. In an interview with the serial killer Ted Bundy, um, just the day before he, were, before he died, uh, Ted Bundy spoke of his early pornography habit. I'm not suggesting you're going to go on to be a serial killer. But Ted Bundy spoke of his violent porn habit and, and the addictive behavior. And he said that porn is addictive and porn is progressive and porn is dangerous because it never satisfies, it never gives you the real thing. And so it writes checks that it cannot cash. It gives you a pathway to pleasure, but it never gives you satisfaction. And so we always want more. It also spreads in that it spoils self-image and self-worth. Some people have critiqued my preaching, and I get that, and they've said, hey, you talk about this particular issue too much. I said, I disagree. I don't think I talk about it enough. Because in my office, I have a constant stream of young men who cannot go a day without consuming a ton of content. And they hate themselves as a result. I spoke to a guy this morning, used to be a pastor, still feels called into the ministry. I was like, so what gives? Why aren't you in the ministry? I feel disqualified, man, because I can't go a day. I can't go a day. Does your wife know? No. I have a constant stream of young women in my office who have been used and abused by men as if they were objects. Those men were trained. Those men were trained early on that that is what women are for. We are speaking to more and more couples who don't feel like they can continue because one of the partners, either the man or the woman, is having to compete with a fantasy life that they can never live up to. This ruins people. And so I would say we don't talk about it enough because God loves people. Lastly, cheap sex is actually really, really costly. It bears a, a massive cost for consumers who live secret lives of guilt and shame. And we've already spoken about that. But it's also really, really costly to the creators who pay through slavery, bondage, defilement, and abuse. The dirty little secret that this industry will never tell you is that it isn't nearly as free and liberating or as sexy as it pretends to be. There are more sex slaves alive today in our generation than in any other generation before us. 
many of them are creating the content that we consume. Many people are tricked into the industry through clever manipulation and kept in the industry through brutality and abuse. And so it's been our great privilege over the last week or so to get to know two amazing ladies who have seen the other side of the industry. And so we thought it would be powerful to get them up here tonight and just have them tell their stories. I know if you've been at one of the ladies' events this week, you've heard some of this already, but we think it's going to be powerful to hear again. And so, um, BBC, why don't you just give a, a really warm welcome to our friends, Chrissy Moran, Harmony Dust. Chrissy is a former uh, porn star who's uh, met Christ and her life has been transformed. And uh, she's now uh, using her story to reach out to men and women. And uh, Harmony is a former e exotic dancer, a stripper, who now um, has met Christ and has been redeemed and is now teaching and reaching out to women in the sex industry, in the industry, teaching them that they are loved and treasured and valued and that they have a purpose um, through a ministry that she runs called uh, Treasures. Just this last week, the ladies have spent so much time with us working so hard. We're so grateful. You flew 41 hours to get here, and then we put you straight to work. Um, they were in the high school with me on Tuesday, which was very distracting because the boys really wanted to be with you guys um, and not with me. Even when I told them that I was also a dancer once, that didn't seem to, uh, <laughs> to help the situation at all. In fact, seemed to drive some of them to want to leave um, pretty promptly. Um, but they were there with, the, with, with the, um, the young ladies in the high school, which was amazing. They that evening, they did some training with 30 volunteers in the church, teaching us how to be a church that better reaches out um, to those who are vulnerable in the sex industry, which we're very excited about. Thursday and Friday, they spoke to over 650 women at two women's events, and, and the stories we've heard of transformation coming from that have just been astonishing. And then today, this is their third service in which they're boldly sitting here with a Muppet like me um, and just sharing their story with you guys. So guys, first of all, just thank you so much for coming. Thanks for your boldness. Thanks for your honesty and your humility. Um, you've taught us a lot, and I think it'll be really transformative for us. One of the great lies, as we've said, of the industry is that uh, we get to objectify people in a moment and we never hear their stories or their shaping circumstances or their difficulties or the things that led up to them being in the industry. And, and so um, I thought it'd be good to just ask both of you, just starting with you, Chrissy, what was, what was your early life like? What were some of your early shaping experiences and some of your early memories before you got into the industry? Okay. Um, well, my earliest memories start around age four. Um, and my dad would teach my brother and I the Bible, and my mom would, they would take us to church. My mom sang in the choir. So I had a good um, start um, in the early years. Um, my dad was a, was a pastor before I was born, so he was very knowledgeable of the Bible. Um, when I was around 11 years old, I um, was saved and, and baptized at my church, and um, and things were, you know, seemingly perfect um, at that time. Um, but it wasn't long after that that my dad um, started drinking. Um, he, um, he had a friend that came to live with us that was an alcoholic. And that kind of started that um, ball rolling. And he just got worse and worse. He was um, very abusive to my mom. He got kicked out of the church um, because he would stand up in the middle of the service and call the pastor out. I kick those guys out too. <laughs> So he wasn't even allowed to go to church with us, you know, after like age 11. So um, my mom would continue to take us to church, and um, my brother, um, my brother and I, he's two years younger. And um, let's see, um, around age 12, I would say, um, things just got really bad. My dad became verbally abusive to my mom. Um, he was physically abusive. He um, did just crazy things. He would break things and throw things and everything. He was just out of control. He would go to the bars and um, get in fights with people because he was preaching. And um, so I had a kind of a twisted perception of what who God was. Um, and then around age 12, um, my um, parents had a big fight right before Christmas. And um, it was very violent. And I remember um, hearing my dad say, if you take my babies with you, then I'm going to kill you. And she was, she was actually leaving to, to go to her mom, my grandmother's house. And this is the first time she didn't take us. So um, he, my dad, I remember he handed us both, my brother and I, a trash bag. And he said, put in here whatever you want to take with you. 
And um, we didn't know where we were taking it, but we packed up our stuff, threw it in the truck, and he moved us to another city. And um, in the beginning, my mom would come and visit on the weekends, um, and things just kept getting worse. He was, he was getting more abusive, um, just out of control. And um, as, a, as a young teenager, it was really difficult for me to live in that environment um, because I had a lot of responsibility that I really wasn't prepared to take on. You know, I was doing, doing the laundry. I was making sure we had groceries. I was doing all these things and taking care of my dad and making sure he didn't fall asleep in the tree. <laughs> you know, he was just totally out of control. And um, it was it was a lot. He did fall asleep in a tree. Uh, <laughs> it, it happens to the best of us. You know, uh... Yeah, he he climbed up there to pray, and he didn't come back till the next day. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, <laughs> um, so yeah, so things were just really out of control. And with my mom, it was really hard for her. She, she would come to visit and she wanted to see us and she was so excited. But then my dad would just, he was just totally um, mean to her and irresponsible and he didn't care about her enough. And eventually um, my mom stopped coming because she couldn't handle it anymore. And after she stopped coming, it wasn't very long after that that she met somebody new and she got remarried. And when she remarried, I decided to go live with, um, live with my mom because this life was really confusing and really chaotic. And I thought that I would have a normal life. And my step stepdad was a police officer, so I thought we were going to be rich because we were very low income. So that was like, you know, to me, I was like, wow, we have a convertible car. It was like, you know, kind of big to me. So I thought, you know, that would be more stable. So I went to live with my mom, and in that household, um, things were different, but not necessarily better. So I moved in with my mom. She had been with my dad for 14 years. So when she remarried, she gave everything to her new husband, all of her time and everything. So I spent most of my years, um, teenage years, early teen years, um, in my room isolated, writing, listening to music, and that kind of thing. Um, and then um, when I so when I was around 17, then you know I started dating. I had my first boyfriend, and um, and that relationship seemed um, to kind of fill that vo that empty feeling inside. You know, when my mom remarried, she didn't she stopped going to church, so there was no no God wasn't really in, actively in my life. So I thought. Um, so. Um, so this boy came along and, and, you know, he showed me attention and, and told me he loved me and all those things. And um, I thought, you know, I thought it was, I thought that was like healing that place inside. Um, when I was 17, he did get me pregnant. And um, he told me if I ever got pregnant that um, he would marry me and we'd have a family. And um, my mom, you know, when she found out was very disappointed. She didn't want me to. Um, she wanted me to succeed in life, and that was most important to her. She took me to get an abortion against my will. And um, so that was, you know, very traumatic. So this actually was the second traumatic thing that happened to me. When I was four years old was the first time I was sexually abused. So as a teenager, um, I was very depressed. And, um, yeah, and then going back and forth between the two families. Um, but then as... as um, I realized that relationships could fill that spot, you know, that emptiness inside. So I became, as a um, young adult, um, a relationship addict. So I had to have a man in my life to tell me that I was worth something. And um, <clears throat> so I, I cohabitated a lot. I did online dating. I hooked up a lot, very promiscuous, and my life was, like, totally out of control. And um, the reason I cohabitated is when, when I was 18, after I graduated high school, my mom and stepdad said I needed to move out. And so that kind of pushed me into living with men right away. So after the, that, you know, all of this, you know, craziness with men, um, the, the relationships were abusive. A lot of them brought porn into, the, into our relationship. And, um, and I never felt like I measured up. So as the years progressed um, through all the heartbreaks and all this stuff, <clears throat> I um, ended up 
um, while I was online dating, I found a modeling website and I put my pictures up on this modeling website and to see if I could get work because the people didn't look like fashion models and, and I thought, well, I'll try. And then I got my first job and then I started going to Los Angeles to, to do photo shoots and that's how it all started. You said something fascinating this morning about that, that early instance of abuse in your life. You, you said that there was a, a reason you didn't tell your family that it happened because of something your dad said that really sure, shocked me as a dad. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, well, my dad was very, um, he was very blunt. <laughs> so he basically said, if any man ever touches my daughter, I'm going to kill them. And as a child, you know, I... I didn't tell anybody. I was terrified. So you so. thought your dad was actually going to go kill the guy. And so yeah. to defend him, you never told your dad you'd yeah. been abused as a four-year-old girl. And actually, I didn't even tell my mom until um, my mid-20s. So, oh. yeah. Oh. Harmony, what was it like for you growing up and your shaping circumstances before the industry? So um, I was, my, one of my first memories was of being expor- exposed to porn by my biological father when I was three years old. And um, I didn't really understand exactly what I was seeing, but that the images were very much ingrained in my head. And then I was sexually abused throughout my life, starting at the age of five by both men and women, and then raped as a teen. And it was something that just was like ha- happening again and again throughout my life. And I thought that there was something wrong with me, you know, that kept um, attracting those situations. So I turned all my anger inward and just was filled with shame and was suicidal even from the age of um, eight eight years old writing suicide notes and my first suicide attempt was in elementary school and uh, the amount of abuse that I experienced had a lot to do with the home environment that I was in my mother being a cocaine addict and my dad being my stepdad being a drug dealer and just being exposed to a lot of crazy people and not really having a lot of supervision, being you know left unattended, that sort of thing. Um, and one of my abusers was my mother's boyfriend. At this point, I was 13. And I started um, standing up for myself. He was, on top of being one of my abusers, he was just generally a very disturbing human being. He, um, you know, he had left Canada on... Um, he was trying to get away from charges that he had, you know, he had raped a child. And my mom later admitted that he was a pedophile. And he would tell my brother and I stories of like satanic ritual abuse that he was involved in and kids being raped. And, um, and he was also like, um, he did martial arts. He was some kind of black belt or something. So he would put us in these grips and be like, I could snap your neck in one minute and kill you. So he was a very terrifying person. And so I finally ran away from home and told my mom that I wasn't coming back until he was gone. So she said, fine, come home, he's gone. And I, uh, when I got back, she ended up leaving with him. So she left me at the age of 13 with my eight-year-old brother for three months with $20 that she said was emergency cab fare. I don't know where I would have taken a taxi. Um, <laughs> And a book of food stamps, which are government vouchers for food that we have in our country. And so that didn't last long. And I started stealing food from the liquor store down the street to um, support my brother. And it was during that summer that I became involved with an older boy in the neighborhood. And he would come around. And when he was around, I felt protected. You know, I lived in a neighborhood where there was a lot of gang rivalry. Um, there were, the black and the Mexican gangs were warring, literally warring, back in the 80s and 90s. And there were gunshots every night. At one point, just to give you an example of the kind of environment I was living in, my mother was beaten nearly to death by a man who broke into our house and beat her with brass knuckles. Like, her lips were torn off of her face. And I still remember um, she had called the police, and she called a friend before she lost consciousness. And the police never came, but her friend came and took her to the hospital and saved her life. And I still remember being about eight years old and sitting in the living room three days later when the police finally came. So when this boy came around... And, you know, he's like, I'll I'll take care of you. I'll protect you. He made me feel protected. And when he was around, I didn't have to steal because he would buy us food. So at the time, I just saw a knight in shining armor. And now looking back, I I realized that, you know, he had every intention of exploiting me. He came from a pimp culture. And, you know, at 15 was already talking about I could sell you. And so ultimately, it was that relationship that led me into the sex industry at 19. Um, And the relationship was physically abusive, emotionally abusive, and he became my pimp every night. I came home and gave him all my money, but I stayed because, A, I, that's what I thought normal was. That's what I saw modeled to me, and B, I didn't think I was worth anything else, and 
The other thing I didn't mention earlier is obviously not everyone who's sexually abused end up ends up in the sex industry, um, but a very high percentage of women in the sex industry have been sexually abused, up to 90%. And Chrissy and I, in our experience, I've never met a woman who that wasn't part of her story. Um, but what, what sexual abuse teaches someone is that uh, the, this extreme sense of powerlessness over your own body and to become familiar with being objectified and sexualized. And so while I had, obviously, the first night I walked into the strip club, that environment was completely foreign to me, yet there was something very familiar about being objectified and sexualized. Like It was as though that sexual abuse like had almost groomed me for that experience. Wow. So, so just to clarify from both of you then, I mean, uh, Chrissy, you met a lot of people in the, po in the porn industry, and how many you've met a lot of women in clubs. You, you've never, in your personal experience, come across one who didn't have a shaping story of abuse and degradation, uh, all of them. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's important for consumers of this material um, to, to hear, and it's important for a lot of ladies in our culture who have experienced abuse um, to hear as well, um, that they're not alone. Um, I, I am deeply ashamed of my gender at times, and I'm deeply ashamed of uh, men today as I hear your stories, and so um, I apologize, um, and I'm sorry uh, for what's been done to you. I'm just so grateful for your braveness, your boldness, your humility to be able to share that and shed light on that. I think a lot of people live in secret shame, even in this room, um, and I'm so grateful for you kind of breaking the shackles of that shame. Uh, Chrissy, starting with you, uh, why don't you guys tell us just a little bit about the gap that exists between the fantasy that people see as the end product. So, so for you guys who are watching porn, they, they see this, this polished end product that looks like this fantasy life. What's it really like, the other side of the lens? I mean, are these, these really hyper-sexualized people who are just having a whale of a time? Um, or is there something else going on behind the cameras that we don't know about? Well, for me, um, I, uh, what kind of... Um one of the things that I remember in the beginning was like, I, I thought it was so glamorous. You know, I would go in, I would have one person do my hair, one person do my makeup, and another person dress me. And then, um, so that part of it was kind of, you know, it, it, I kind of liked that part in a way. But then when I started doing the shoot and it would progress into things I wasn't comfortable with, I would just mentally check out. So, it was like I was there, but not really there. Um, and I just would block out everything that I was doing, and it would become about performing. And what what am I going to say? What am I going to, you know, all these things. And the people who are shooting it are feeding you the lines. They're telling you, you know, what what you're supposed to do, what you're supposed to sound like, what words they want you to use. And the, the scenes can be really long and, and difficult. And, you know, after, after it's all done, they edit it and make it look perfect. Mm -hmm. But it's not really like that. And a lot of times, like for me, I, I would mentally check out. That's how I coped with what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And that's what I learned as a child. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's how you deal, you cope with it. So, but a lot of the women that I knew um, would do drugs or um, alcohol on the set. And to just to get through one scene. And a lot of times these women would come in and um, they would be hungover from the night before. And they were, you know, just very unhealthy, very unhealthy lifestyle. And I mean, even me, I didn't, I didn't, I did drugs as well and, and drink and things like that. Um, you know, even though I didn't do it on the set, but my, I was just totally broken mm. inside. Mm. And so... What, what are the sex lives of the women working in the porn industry like? Are they these really free spirits who are willing to try anything, or is that all a facade as well? Yeah, well, a lot of the women that I knew um, didn't like men and didn't enjoy having sex, you know, outside of... In the, of course, they didn't enjoy it working, but they could put on, you know, that false persona and get through it. But a lot of them didn't like having sex at all. Wow. So, so one of the things when we first met that you said is that um, you, you're still learning to cope with kind of a post-traumatic stress disorder um, that you've kind of had to come through through the industry. Mm -hmm. so, so really things get so traumatic um, that people are getting into a mindset where they're just having to deal with coping mechanisms, the same ones you learned to cope with your abuse, mm -hmm. you're then having to live out to, to, to make porn. Yeah. And all the while, people are watching this going, oh, that's what sexuality is like. Yeah, they think that's what a healthy sex life is like it's not. Well, well thanks for, uh, for the honesty on that. I think it's going to be really helpful for some people in the room. Uh, uh, how many of you experienced, I mean, strip clubs seem like these hyper-sexualized, hyper-sexy places with these liberated women. 
um, your experience um, behind the curtain in the, in the dressing rooms there of the lives of those girls, your own experience when you were in the industry? Um, is it as sexy as it looks? Yeah, I, um, research shows actually that women in the sex industry experience post-traumatic stress disorder at rates equivalent to veterans of combat war. And I think I kind of went into it in a state of PTSD just from all the trauma in my, my history. So like Chrissy, I was also able to just completely check out. So I would be standing in front of a customer and just completely not be present and be completely dissociated. Um, and then the other thing is that I remember the first night I got there when the DJ asked me what name I wanted to put in the rotation, I was like, Harmony. And when I saw him put my name in black and white on the board, I couldn't take it. I was like, take that down, erase it. I'll be Monique. And from that moment forward, I created this entire persona that was Monique. And it was a complete lie, completely separate to who I'm a, I am as a person. Um, and it was safe for me to hide behind Monique. But then in time, I really began to lose sight of who Harmony even was. I mean, nobody in my life even called me Harmony. And, you know, um, you know, there, we have to perpetuate the lie that we like what we're doing. If you had come into the club, I would have said, yes, of course, I love it. I'm putting myself through school and, you know, I get to exercise, like all the lies. We all have them. And, um, but the truth is, is that, you know, a lot of us, I would say most of us, not only did we not like what we were doing, but hate men, like hated men. I, I got to the point towards the end where I was so angry towards men. You know, in the club, I was assaulted many times. And if you try to stand up for yourself against sexual assault when you're a stripper, people look at you like you're crazy because you, you're asking for it. And it just got to the point where I was so angry that I would just wish that someone would put a finger on me because I, I literally would beat men. I had the police called on me several times. I was getting so angry and so violent towards them. And, um, and I, I didn't have to use drugs, but earlier today when we, were, when we were doing this earlier, I had this memory that I hadn't had in a long time, but of one of my friends who would use to get through a shift. And one night, I don't know what she had taken, some concoction of something and way too much of it. Um, but she was in the dressing room and she couldn't stand, she couldn't open her eyes. I mean, she looked like she was on the verge of like, I think she, an overdose. And um, but the managers made her get out on stage for her set. And because she couldn't stand, she literally crawled onto the stage. And I remember, because I was next, so I remember being behind the curtain, and I was so worried about her and just peeking out and looking at her. And the, the crazy thing to me is the men that were sitting at the stage were tipping her. Like, they thought it was a part of her act, and they couldn't even see that she was like, I mean, could have died that night. She had used so much and couldn't even open her eyes. And so... It's, um, it's such a lie. So, so those men have objectified women in that environment to, to such an extent that they can't even see a human being in trouble um, in front of them. Um, one of the things that really strikes me about that, uh, Harmony, is that uh, you know, men are going home and evaluating their wife against Monique, and Monique doesn't exist. I mean, she's a fallacy. I mean, she doesn't exist anywhere in the world. You, you, you aren't her, and, and, and it's, all, it's all an act. It's all a facade. We believe in a, in a proactive God who reaches down and, and saves people, people with messy lives and messy circumstances. And both of you have great stories of uh, God's redemption for Chrissy, of coming back to Christ, and for Harmony, for you being awakened to Christ for the first time. Which is give us the kind of cliff notes version of, uh, of what it was like um, coming back uh, to Jesus for you, Chrissy, and for, and for meeting Jesus for the first time for you, Harmony. Uh, what happened? What led up to that? You had some shaping circumstances, some interactions that, that led to you reuniting with Christ. Chrissy, what was that like? Okay. Well, I was in the industry for seven years, and... Um, cohabitating, living with men, being abused. The men that I, you know, a lot of the boyfriends that I had still looked at porn. Um, it was never enough. And, you know, it just did so much to my self, self-worth. Like, you know. So you've got guys who are living with a porn star, mm -hmm. still consuming porn because that's, that's yeah. not enough. Yeah. I, and what, one of the boyfriends in particular, um, Every night, I would catch him looking at porn. Um, not only that, he would rape me about 10 times a day. And it was extremely physically abusive, um, verbally abusive relationship. Um, every day, he would tell me that he was going to kill me, um, that nobody would love me, all of these things. And that was three and a half of the seven years I was in the industry. So um, for me, um, I got to, a, after a, you know, a bunch of relationships, I ended up living with what the last guy that I lived with in the industry, and um, he was—he kind of was normal. He didn't abuse me, and I thought 
I thought, um, I thought that I would marry him. And, um, you know, it didn't take much to qualify for that. You just had to be nice. And, um, and he was. So, you know, we were together a year and eight months. And at the end of our relationship, he went to work on a mainstream movie because he was an actor. And while he was, before he left, we usually spent 24 hours a day because I really didn't have to go to work because I had a website that paid very well and it was a recurring income. So I rarely had to do stuff outside of what my own website did. Um, so anyway, when he went to go out of town, I got really insecure, and I, you know, one of the things I, you know, was like, don't go to a strip club or anything like that, please, you know. I wasn't working with men at the time, so I somehow thought that, you know, even if he was looking at other women, he was a good enough guy that he wasn't going to think about being with them, um, and that I had worked so hard on creating this fantasy that I thought that would be enough. And they, you know, but still, I was still insecure. I said that. And um, when he was out there, um, he called me, and um, I heard music. I heard, you know, like the bass in the background. It's 2 a.m. And I asked him where he was, and he lied and said he was at a restaurant. And, um, and I knew that he was at a strip club. Um, and the next day, he finally confessed to me. And for some reason, um, I still had hope that, that, men were supposed to be better. One of the things that my dad did teach me, although his teachings were kind of, you know, mess, like confusing, but he did teach me the verse that you put up earlier, Matthew 5:28, that if a man looks upon a woman with lust, he's cr- committed adultery in his heart. And um, so even though I was in the industry, I still had this hope that that would happen for me, like that, that I would meet somebody who didn't do that. Mm-hmm. So when he told me, he confessed the next day, I kind of fell to the floor and cried and cried and cried. And I just had the realization that even though I was, I created myself into being what I thought every, any man would want, I still wasn't quite enough to keep a man. So, and I, you know, cried out to God while I was crying. And I said, if you're real, please show me a sign. I haven't felt your presence in my life since I was a little girl. And everything I know about love is distorted and perverted. And, um, you know, just make yourself known to me. And then um, a couple of days later, um, I went out to where he was filming. I had spent a couple of days just kind of praying and writing and journaling and, you know, thinking about what had happened. And, in my life in general. So I did a lot of soul searching. When I went out to where he was filming, I met a guy on the set. Um, When my boyfriend wasn't around, he asked me what I did for a living. And I said, I did modeling. And he said, what kind of modeling? And I said, oh, calendars and bikinis. And, you know, in my personal life, we didn't tell people um, generally that um, I did porn. We just, you know, didn't talk about it to our friends and stuff like that. Um, Well, to his friends. So anyway, he kept asking me, and eventually I said, okay, I do porn. And he said, I already knew that. Your boyfriend um, was, had already told everybody, and he was showing people your pictures and things like that. And even though it was already out there and anybody could see it, I still didn't want, <laughs> I still didn't want my boyfriend showing it to people. So I felt really disrespected and... and um, you know, and I was just sitting there, and I was just felt really down. And he, the next thing he says is like, um, "Let me ask you something. Do you believe in God?" And it was that small question that um, changed my entire life because I knew that that was the sign that I had prayed for. And at that moment, um, I said, "Yes, I do." And he took me outside, and we prayed together. And um, I changed. You know, th- after that, I decided to give up everything and and um, changed my entire life. So in that moment, after one conversation, uh, one Christian guy takes a risk, um, you leave the boyfriend, you leave the industry, you leave the whole life, and you start a whole new journey um, with Jesus Christ in a moment. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. And it's, and it's been messy <laughs> going forward. I mean, the internet continues, the images out there continue. Um, but in an instant, through one conversation, you, you start on a new path. Yeah. Amazing. Great. Uh, How many for you? Also, God used someone just to speak to you directly in a, in, a, in a different way that set you on a path towards him. Tell us a bit about that. 
Yeah, I, um, for me, it was about meeting someone, a friend in a local ballet call, uh, class at college who just showed me the unconditional love of God. And she was unlike anyone I had ever met before. And I was surprised to find out that she was Christian because um, I was raised like very anti-Christianity, anti-Christians. My mother is a Native American rights activist, and I was taught that Christianity is the white man's religion that he uses for oppression. I, I know. <laughs> I told my mom that, too. I'm like, um, I don't know if you've noticed. Um, but anyways, <laughs> don't, don't try to argue with her. Trust me. It has not worked. Um, and then my, my stepfather, who raised me, was an atheist. My brother, an atheist. And so um, I was just really surprised by her and by just um, what a normal person she seemed like. And, you know, when she asked me what I did for a living, I normally would lie to people, but I told her the truth. And she didn't judge me. And she invited me to church. It was the last place I wanted to be. I didn't want to go to church. I thought, if there is a God, I don't think I like him. And surely he wouldn't want anything to do with me. So I didn't say yes to her for a long time. And her friendship with me wasn't contingent on that. She would take me to coffee and ask me what kind of music I liked and just really made me feel respected as a person. And so I finally took her up on her offer to go to church. And I walked in that place, and I felt instantly like I was home. And I didn't know much, but I knew I wanted to come back every time the doors were open. So much so that I had my manager change my shift on a Wednesday night so I could come in late, so I could go to Wednesday night service. Um, and it wasn't because I was trying to live a double life or, you know, have some kind of scandalous thing happening. I just, my life was my life, and I didn't know how to live any differently than I had been living. And it was a process of the Holy Spirit doing a work in my heart that led to change in my life. And as the Holy Spirit began to show me, and as I was consistently attending church and reading the Bible, I started learning that I am loved, valued, and purposed, um, which is the tagline for our ministry, because I believe that a revelation of that will um, will lead to transformation, because I couldn't live in a way that contradicted that anymore. And, um, and so for me, it was a messy process. Ironically, the very first thing that God asked me to give up when I started asking him, what does it look like to abide in you how can I someone had shared the scripture John 15 5 I am the vine and you are the branches if you remain in me you will bear fruit but apart from me man can do nothing and he shared his testimony and I'd never heard one before and he had been a drug addict and on the streets and God turned turned his life around and he shared that scripture and it hit me that I was like that withered branch disconnected and cried out to God and asked him to show me you know how, how I could abide in him and the first thing I felt God lay on my heart was abstinence so that was my first step which is kind of funny because I was an abstinent stripper for a little while um, an abstinent church attending stripper an abstinent <laughs> church attending stripper but God knew what he was doing because for me that was the bigger stronghold that relationship that I was in it took I, I remember the day I called him um, up and I said you know I can't be with you anymore. I'm not giving you any more of my money. It's over. Don't contact me. And, you know, he said, I don't understand. And I said, you don't have to understand. You just have to accept it. And hung up the phone and realized I'm alive still. I'm okay. I, ac I actually don't need him to survive. Um, so it was a process. And then one night I found myself, you know, at the club and I couldn't see a way out. I literally couldn't see how I would ever be able to leave. Um, but one night I was standing there on stage and I looked around and I realized, Nobody here even sees me. Everybody's looking at me, and nobody even sees me. And it was just too much and had this moment with God um, and went to my manager and said, I'm quitting. I'm, I'm leaving. And he was confused. I was one of the top earners in the club at the time, and I never saw anybody quit the industry, let alone when they were making money, you know. And he, he was like, do you need a night off? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm gone. <laughs> I'm gone for good. And because I didn't want to weigh back, I went to the dressing room and started selling my clothes immediately. And I remember what the girls said to me in the, in the room that night. They said, you'll be back. Nobody ever leaves. Wow. And I, as a matter of fact, if you know me, that just made it like concrete. Oh, I'm, I will never be back. <laughs> and I never went back until I started doing outreach there. Wow. Wow. Praise God. <laughs> So, so we're going to wrap this thing up. You ladies have been so, so wonderful. Why don't you just tell us, just kind of in closing, um, Chrissy, starting with you, what is life like now? Um, what's going on in your life? Some big things that are happening and, and what's God teaching you and um, how, how's it going with you at the moment? Okay. Well, I've been out of the industry for seven years, so it's been a really long path of healing and recovery and um, learning um, what a healthy relationship looks like and um, 
you know, my recovery, there was a lot of things to work on. And the last thing, unlike Harmony, that, that the, the, the thing that I had the hardest time getting free from was um, being abstinent. Um, but I did, I did accomplish that, and I have been abstinent. Well, not now, but I'll tell you about that in a minute. But uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so um, anyway, so I did. <laughs> I was abstinent, and um, <laughs> and one of the things that um, I had to give up was dating. And for me, it had to go even even like more intense than that. I had a lot of guy friends in Los Angeles, California. There's a lot of single people, even in the Christian community. And everybody has a birthday party. There's always parties, always people around. People get together and watch movies. I had lots of guy friends, and I had to give that up as well because it had to go even deeper for me personally. Because your identity was found in how men treated you and how they valued you. Exactly, yeah. So um, even if I wasn't dating the guy, they're still feeling something. They're, they're giving me a little male attention, mm. making me feel special, even if I wasn't interested in dating them. Mm. And a lot of times they still wanted to date me, even though they didn't admit it. Mm. So <laughs> I had to give that up, and I had no guys come into my apartment, and I didn't call, text. I told everybody, I'm going on a fast. You know, don't call me. Don't contact me. Don't email me. You can just, if you want to contact me, you can post something publicly on my Facebook. But that was it. Mm. And um, But it, during that time, right before I went on my fast, I started talking to a guy who um, didn't live near me. He, he lived in um, Houston, Texas. And um, he was a friend, just purely a friend. And the only reason I prayed about it and I felt like God didn't tell me to include him in my fast because he brought me closer to God. And um, one of the things he did... Um, well, he was there through several meltdowns, and um, he um, would teach me about God. And we did Bible studies together. He would type them all up, and we would, you know, read it separately and get together and talk about him later. And um, he would go over the answers with me, and purely friendship. And he did not want to date me. There was no way. And, um, you know, through that, you know, I, and I was going through my fast, and I was thinking, God, I need, I want the kind of guy that I want, I could not get being the person that I was. So I had to actually work on becoming the kind of woman that would attract that kind of a man. And that's what I really worked on. And um, you were, we were friends and for at least a year. Um, it was 10 months till we met. And then, you know, it was, gosh, I, I get my timeline all messed up. But it, we were friends for over a year. And then we started dating. And we dated... Um, for about five months, then we got engaged, and then two weeks ago, before I came out here, we got married. So, mm-hmm. uh, praise God! I, I remember watching an interview with you with uh, Pastor Mark Driscoll in Seattle, and right at the end of that, he he prayed over you and prophesied that that a good godly man was going to come, and that he was going to be your husband, and he pictured that day. And praise God that God was good to His word, and that a good godly man. Um, has, has come along, and uh, he just cherishes you, and we'll be praying for you. So that's that's wonderful. Uh, how many? What's your life like? What's treasures like? Um, how's it going? What's recovery look like for you? Um, what's God teaching you? That's a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> them off here. We're just going. Um, well, recovery, I believe, is just an ongoing journey. And when I say that, I mean just the process of becoming who God has created us to be, really. Um, but the first couple of years were quite intense. Um, and after that, I just got to a place where, you know, I had a sense of wholeness and um, identity in, in Jesus. And um, one day I found myself sitting across the street from the strip club that I used to work at and was praying for the women, which I often did. But at that point, I just realized I had to do more. And so I, um, I started writing handwritten notes on these little postcards that said, her value is far above rubies and pearls. And um, I thought that is the message that I would want to communicate to the women that I used to work with. So I wrote the notes and put them on the girls' cars. And then after that, um, just the whole vision for Treasures was birthed and had no idea 10 years ago that we would be doing what we're doing today. And we're reaching um, women in 170 strip clubs in L.A., Las Vegas, and Orange County and providing peer mentoring and a therapist-led support group and just coming alongside them and helping them live healthy and flourishing lives. And because I can't, I, I want to see every single strip club woman in the sex industry 
in the world reached, um, and at one point thought of renting a motorhome and taking a tour. <laughs> um, well, that's not very feasible. I came up with a different idea. So we started um, several years ago training leaders to replicate this model of outreach in their communities and have trained leaders in 60 cities throughout the world. And now we get to add South Africa to our map. So very exciting. Yeah, awesome. You are a brave and, and fearless leader um, leading that ministry and just reaching out to those women, transforming lives. And we're very, very grateful for that work. We can't wait to see the fruit here in our own community. We've got sex industry kind of very close to our door. Um, and we, we can't wait to see uh, women liberated and cherished and valued and purposed um, because of the message that can go out to them. So, ladies, thank you so much um, for your stories. Um, uh, you have served us so well as a community. I think we'll be forever transformed. I'm going to wrap this thing up in a sec, but let me just pray for you. Um, and then we can let you go um, so that you don't get swamped down in the front. Your Father God, thank you so much uh, for these ladies. Thank you for your grace to them. Thank you for your hand of protection over them, even though there's been times in their lives that have been um, difficult to understand. Um, we believe that you have been watching on as a, as a loving dad, knowing that you had a big plan for them, um, the redemption of their story, so that what looked like evil would be used for good and for the saving of many lives. We're seeing that in our midst now. Thank you that they responded to you. Thank you um, that they worship you and that they love you and that their story is now being used to give voices to other women around the globe and that their story is now being used to, to help men um, who are consumers of cheap sex to, to kind of stop that and to, to honor their spouses and their, their future spouses. Thanks for their honesty. Thanks for their humility. Thanks for their wonderful beauty and value um, and purpose. I pray that you would bless their ministries, that you would bless their lives, that you would bless their families, that you'd give them safe travels home and that they would go on to live uh, long and happy lives in which they get to give great testimony to your grace and to your saving power. We're deeply grateful for their time. I pray that you would bless them deeply with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want you guys to say thank you to Chrissy and Harmony. Thanks, guys. So Chrissy and Harmony will be available to chat to you afterwards. They'll be out in the foyer at a resource table. We have a number of books for sale. We're not trying to make any money, unfortunately. Uh, Chrissy's, uh, I mean, Harmony's book sold out. Um, and so uh, that we don't have copies of that available. We've got a lot of other resources for you sold at cost. And we'd uh, encourage you to go along and to purchase some of those. But also encourage you just to go along and chat to those ladies and just to thank them. Maybe share some of your own stories as well. Um, they're, they're deeply appreciative of the love that's been shown to them by this community. And we would encourage you to engage with them for a little bit of afterwards if you can. How, how do we respond? Um, we, we are over time, but I do want to use the next six minutes just trying to outline how do we dream of responding as a church community. Um, some of you aren't part of this community. This will help you understand the kind of community that we want to be and perhaps will inspire you to, to, to live out in another church community these kind of values. Some of you haven't even crossed the line of faith and aren't part of a community at all. I'm hoping that this will remove some of the objections that you have as a church because I believe that we need to respond communally. This isn't just a personal issue. This this is a community issue, and I believe that we need to respond as a community. And so in response to this, in response to what we have learned as a community, we have some dreams, and we'll just put them up here. I'll just talk about them, just five of them. Uh, the first one is that we dream that this is a, a community where it's okay to be not okay. Uh, the truth is that we are all fixer-uppers. If you're a sexual sinner, confess. Tell someone. God loves to save sinners. That's kind of why he came into the world, but you've got to confess. The scriptures tell us that if we confess our sin to God, he forgives us and he cleanses us. That shame that you now feel because of your sexual sin, he can take that away. Uh, no one else can take that away. It also tells us in James 5, 16, to confess our sins one to another. And so whether you're a sexual sinner or you're someone who's been sinned against, speak to someone else. Shed some light on the situation. Don't walk in shame and secrecy. Um, that James passage goes on to say, so that you may be healed. We confess our sin one to another so that we may find healing. It doesn't bring further shame. It brings glory and it brings wonder. And so we would really encourage you tonight, wherever you are, speak to somebody. Um, go pick up some of the resources at the resource table. Chat to someone. Get someone to pray for you. Phone the church. Get, get some help from our counseling staff. Chat to someone who's here with you. Speak to somebody. If you're a sexual sinner and your spouse doesn't know, tell your spouse. Tell your spouse. Secondly, we dream of being a community where we reach out to culture with a posture of grace. Uh, we've heard from the stories of these ladies that someone reached out to them with a moment of grace. Someone didn't expect them to clean themselves up before they could be accepted by Christ. And we dream of being a community that's exactly the same as that. 
Uh, we want to be a community um, where grace is rich and where grace is amazing and where grace is um, a predictable response to people's struggle. And so I want to tell you that they, we're not going to be shaming you. We don't want to be shaming you in terms of your own sin and struggles. We want to be, uh, have a posture of grace and warmth and welcome and love. Uh, I want to tell you that that starts in the hearts of the believers here in this community. How do you judge other people? The way that you view other people will will, will see how much that you value grace. Thirdly, we dream of being a community where women are safe and valued and where men are watchful and mature. I'm tired of our stats. I'm tired of our stats. And so we call men unashamedly to a higher calling than they are currently pursuing. Now, we spoke on this last week. We dream of a day when we don't hear stories of abuse from our young women. And we move towards that day by men being men who refuse to believe the lie that women are objects for their enjoyment and, cons- and consumption. We move towards that day by brave women telling their stories and overcoming the shame inflicted upon them by bad men. Fourthly, we dream of being a community that is serious about fleeing from sexual immorality. We want to be a place that has such a high view of sex, such a high view of marriage, such a high view of God, that we refuse to dabble in anything that compromises any of those. Uh, We are calling us to a radical approach towards sexual purity. And this is what Jesus spoke of. He said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, guide it out. Now, I don't think he was calling us to be a maimed and crippled society. I think he was telling us, be serious about this. Be serious about this. Don't think, listen, don't think you get to be the one exception. Don't think you get to be the one of like, oh, it, it, it hurt other people, but I can, I can control this. It, to prove you can control it, stop. Flee from sexual immorality. Flee from it. That means turning in the other direction and running away. The world really, really, really needs a church that stops disqualifying itself from having a voice in society because it fails to practice what it preaches. And lastly, we dream of being a community that is big on new beginnings and that is hopeful for change for people. I naively believe that people can change. I get a front row seat to watching the redemption of people every single day. Jesus told the religious guys of his day that he was more interested in the strugglers and the strainers. He said that he came for the sick and not for the healthy. If you are sick, you can change. We take the Bible at its word when it says that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. We just choose to believe that for people's lives again and again and again. I would highly recommend a couple of resources uh, to you tonight if you're a struggler. Um, If you've been sinned against sexually, we've got a book for sale tonight at cost written by a friend of mine called Justin Holcomb and and his wife, Lindsay, called Rid of My Disgrace. I would highly, highly recommend it to you as a device to help you change. It's going to teach you about the love of God, even in the difficulty of your circumstances. If you're struggling with habitual sin and you go like, I don't think I can change, there's a book out there that's for you. It's called You Can Change. (laughs) It's kind of all in the title. And it's written by a friend of ours called Tim Chester. I would, I would just lovingly put it in your hands. If I could buy you each a copy, I would. Um, but it's about how the gospel actually makes us into new creations. Those are, those are out there alongside some other resources today. Um, but, but you can change in community. And so I'd ask you, if you've crossed the line of faith, take it seriously. If you haven't crossed the line of faith, take it seriously. It's a big question. Ask if it could be possibly true. And ask if your current, if your current life is working for you. If it's not, Christ says to, says to you, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. Father God, thank you so much um, for your grace. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Um, he doesn't expect us to be perfect. He knows we're strugglers and strainers, but he, um, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He didn't ask us to clean us up, uh, ourselves up first. He, he reached down and paid the ultimate price because of our sin and rebellion. Lord, I pray that that message would resound clearly in our ears and in our hearts tonight. And that we as strugglers and strainers, people who are spiritually sick, would cry out to you, the great physician, um, and that you would start our process of healing. 
I pray that first and foremost, we would be honest. We'd be honest with ourselves where we need to repent. We would repent. Where we need to acknowledge that we have been wounded, we would at least acknowledge that. I pray that we would be honest with others, that we would tell them us, and, and that we would be honest with you. We would talk to you, the author and perfecter of our faith, and that we would trust you um, with our healing and restoration. Begin a work in our midst tonight. Fan into flame something new, something that cannot be put out, something that transforms families, something that's transforming this city, and something that will go on to transform this nation because we need a whole lot of transformation. Father, we love you. We trust you. I give these people, your children, back into your hands. I ask you that you do the work that only your Holy Spirit can do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.